Good morning, everyone. Thank you for making it for this webinar. Before we start, I would just like to share a few reminders with you. Please note that this event is being recorded and we will share the full recording with you. After the presentations, we will open a space for questions and answers. You will see a questions panel where you can type in your questions or comments and communicate with us during this webinar. There is also a button for raising your hand to get our attention. So please feel free to try it now. The session will be moderated by myself, Amy Ongeso. I work for Namati as a senior global network officer. I am based in Nairobi, Kenya, and will be also moderated by my colleague, Santana Simiu, who works for ICJ Kenya. Thank you, Amy. Good morning, everybody. My name is Santana Sibir, as Amy has just said. I work for ICJ Kenya. ICJ Kenya works to promote human rights, justice, and democracy in Kenya and the region. The institution has also been promoting access to justice at the grassroots through the coordination of its six paralegal networks. We were also involved, we were also amongst the civil society organizations involved in the campaigns for the enactment of the Legal Aid Act. The purpose of the webinar today is to commemorate the coming into force of the Legal Aid Act on 26th April 2016. The topic of discussion today will be to discuss the challenges and the opportunities for the different legal aid actors during this period of the COVID-19 pandemic. So we will begin with uh, perspectives from state and non-state actors in Kenya. And I will begin with Mr. Eric Mukoya, who is the Executive Director of the Legal Resources Foundation. Eric. Um, the government has taken drastic measures in order to curb the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic. While this is necessary, it has led to an increase in human rights violations. For instance, we saw on the first day of the enforcement of the curfew, there was a lot of police brutality was meted on innocent Kenyans, including persons who offer essential services. As an organization that conducts legal aid, uh, what challenges are you facing in this context and how have you been able to adapt your work in light of the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first, I'll begin by saying a statement. The disease is temporary, but the shift on how we do our stuff is going to be permanent. So this is a transition. Uh, there are a number of challenges that I speak to, but addressing the judiciary, Kenya Prison Services, National Police Service. Number one, we have a judiciary that is, is slow and averse to technology. Number two, we have prison facilities that are close to everyone, yet people in remand to try detention require to be assisted. Number three, we have a police force or service that has gone rogue and therefore make, making a lot of violations. And generally, we have a justice sector, actors who have no strategy to coordinate their work in this particular situation. Having said that, we have specific emerging issues. One, we have arbitrary arrest by police, and that no one is talking to. Two, we have a delayed litigation process because the judiciary is not sitting but people are suffering in detention and in cells. Number three, we have abuse of due process. For instance, how does it happen that the cabinet secretary for, for health has become the police, has become the prosecutor by arresting you and taking you to a quarantine? There's due process. You have a 24 hour rule. There are mechanisms you can use to deal with some of those issues. What happened to Article 49, for example, on uh, rights for arrested people? When you are arrested for to a quarantine, are you arrested to a police station? Is, is that similar to a police station? That's a question we need to ask. We have now overuse of incarceration in the name of quarantine. We have been struggling to deal with the incarceration. But as it stands now, there are more incarcerated people than we had an, about a month ago. We have reduced freedoms and liberties, uh, which could be necessary, yes. Uh, but I think it is, uh, it is overused with the current situation. For lack of information, there could be many extrajudicial killings happening right now, but who is focusing on that? That's a question we need to be asking. 
Something else that uh, I think we need to be alluded to is we have emergency legislation. Emergency legislation that speaks to how the quarantine needs to work, emergency legislation that speaks to how testing needs to work, and in that context, there's likelihood that there are many violations that are going to happen. Just going to what the, the direction that the questions were having, there was a question about, so what support do we require in this context? Number one is we require good leadership. And I'm looking at the president, for example, Uhuru Kenyatta, with all his excellency, is that why does he have to come to talk to us in an unstructured manner? And he causes panic all over. Can you have a structured way where the president can speak to his people? For example, let's know that the president will talk to us every Friday. And that means we will be having some approaches that are coordinated. Number two, can they share relevant and timely information with the public? You cannot wake up at three and close people at six. Emergency or no emergency, that one doesn't agar very well. For donors, I'd be interested to know, are they likely to shift their focus? Because if the donors shift their focus to COVID-19, it will kill the bigger picture of whatever it is that they wanted to address. And that is a point that I would like a uh, donor community to address. And number three of that is, can you start thinking of sustainability as donors? How many institutions, for example, right now, are going to close shop because they can't pay rent? That is something we need to think through. And therefore, thinking of how to build institutions. Having said that, I would speak to, okay, something else before I forget. We have learned ab about violations on women and children. This country has no safe houses for women and children. There are many women who are being abused right now because they have nowhere else to go. And that's something we may want to address. Having said that, let me say what exactly LRF has done in terms of um, response. Number one is to encourage public legal education through the media. The radio stations are available, the TV stations are available, social platforms are available, and people need to get real legal information out there. Number two is we've been collecting data through the same medias, just data on violations, data on abuses that are necessary to bring out what we can call the untold stories of COVID-19. Because there are many untold stories out there that we may want to speak to. Something else we've done as LRF is we have facilitated court sessions between two courts and the prison facilities to ensure that pleas and mentions are carried out so that we decongest some of those prison facilities and uh, decrease uh, opportunities for infection. And this has been picked up very well. So we're talking about three prisons and about two court stations and two more coming up. And this interaction has led to a number of things. One, we have had sessions where bail and bond terms have been reviewed just to ensure that people who have bail terms that are unaffordable can afford them and can live in castration centers. Number two of that, we have been able to pay some fines and some small bail terms. For example, somebody who is charged 2000 Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, that is a, a, an internet issue. Then number three is we've been doing remote capturing for police so that they can carry out diversion at the police center level, that then people don't have to come to the criminal justice system. This is an opportunity we are trying to activate alternative dispute resolution so that people don't have to come to the court process that is not working right now. And that we have done in a number of places. Something else we think it will work, which we are trying in our hands, is can we have constant sharing of legal information on SMS platforms, on social media platforms? And part of that, can you develop a 10 pointer, which we are trying to develop, of the likely violations and the likely reciprocation methods that the public is aware during quarantine, these are some of the things that they are likely to go through. Then we are also looking at community driven but court annexed mediation. Uh, I don't know if I can have time to explain that. Where communities go to court and request for mediating certain matters that are already in the system. That is working in areas of Visiolo where we do a lot of work. And uh, something else, and this will be a proposal, is are we able to develop toll free legal lines so that people can share information of legal issues that they are faced with? And last, 
as LRF, we've been developing audiovisual materials to continue doing the things that we do in places where we cannot access. In a nutshell, that is our response. Thank you. Your efforts will go a long way into promoting access to justice during this time. We'll now move to the next panelist, Ms. Wanjiro Kamanda, who is the Deputy Executive Director at FIDA Kenya. Wanjiro, on 1st uh, April, we saw the Chief Justice say that 35% of the criminal matters currently being reported are sexual offenses. Mm -hmm. The perpetrators are close relatives and or guardians. Mm -hmm. So as an organization that has been promoting legal awareness for women for a very long time, what approach do you take to assist victims considering the sensitive nature of sexual offenses and the trauma thereafter? Thank you, Santana. Uh, they've been uh, mentioned by various actors in the recognition that there has been quite an increase in the cases of sexual and gender-based violence during this period. One is by the Chief Justice, the Ministry of Health has also noted, and the Ministry of Public Service. As an institution, we have also noted that um, we've received quite a number of uh, sexual and gender-based uh, cases reported to us. We rolled out a toll-free number on 15th April uh, of this year, 0800 uh, What we have noticed is that looking at our statistics, in the first week since we rolled out the number, we had received over 100 cases. A majority of those cases that we received were actually domestic or intimate partner violence cases, and uh, followed by child maintenance cases and defilement cases. Then uh, what's the reason for this? I think uh, it's quite um, easy to see that um, one of the reasons why we've had such an increase is because while well, the directives by the government and the Ministry of Health are very important in terms of curtailing and stopping the spread of COVID, they've also placed most a number of women in um, close proximity to their abusers for a very long time so that we have women in abusive relationships placed at a higher risk for abuse during this period due to the extended hours a day they are forced to be with their abusive partners thanks to the working from home and staying from home directives. Additionally, we've also noted that um, because of um, the curfew that has been put in place, women who are in abusive relationships at times will be unable to physically escape from um, abuse when they say the abuse is happening at night. We have also noted that due to the travel restrictions to and from some counties, women are unable to escape, for example, to their relatives up country, which, are, which would have been an option in other times. And then we have also noted an, a spike in sexual abuse cases. And one of this is that because our children are at home at the moment, um, they, they are also placed at a risk. Most sexual predators are people who are known, well known to children. Most of them are relatives, neighbors, and friends. So those could be the reasons why we've noted that spike. Then in terms of interventions as an institution, we have um, come up with a number of methods which we are trying to still reach our clients and women in general in the country. Our first step was rolling out our toll-free number through which we continue to offer legal advice and also offer free counseling to our clients. We have also embarked on conducting mediation sessions on phone and we are progressively innovating different ways of continuing with our access to justice work. One of the, on the main challenges that we are currently facing as um, the previous speaker noted, we lack an elaborate and functional survivor protection system that would include the accommodation of survivors of violence in a safe shelter. And this remains a hindrance to access of, to justice as a number of GBV survivors shy away from reporting incidences of violence for fear that um, upon reporting them, where would they shelter? We also have um, religious and cultural beliefs and stereotypes which uh, normalizes gender-based violence, especially intimate partner violence, and this continues to be a hindrance even during this period. Sadly, we have also noted that some of our survivors are very afraid of the police and they shy away from reporting. So we'd urge the police to have, you know, to make more effort to be more approachable by citizens to enable uh, survivors of gender-based violence approach them and report. Then, in terms of challenges, we've also noted that um, some of our legal aid activities. For example, legal awareness forums, legal aid clinics, and self-representation trainings, for example, for female prisoners, have been interrupted 
We are, however, planning alternative means through which we can conduct the seed activities through the use of technology and mass media where possible. Another aspect, and this would be for women in the country generally, is that there's an economic impact you know, of this COVID situation. We, the, some of the domestic laborers, women flower farm workers, small business owners who we work with have been hit hard by the current crisis. Some were laid off from work, while those running small businesses are finding it very difficult to continue to make ends meet. And this could also be the contributing factor to the way to why we are getting quite an increase in the number of child maintenance cases that are reported at this period. Some of the emerging issues that we've noted in terms of access to justice for our clients, we have continued to engage with various actors in the justice sector to protect women's access to justice during this period. We have had a good support with the police uh, in the matters that we have referred to them. Then we have noted that due to the, dis, uh, the downscaling of court physical operations and embracing of uh, technology through e hearings and e filing, we have continued to file some matters for clients. There is, however, a challenge in terms of the fact that most of our clients are self representing clients. We train them on self representation and then they represent themselves in court. The challenge currently is that a good number of them do not have access to internet. Additionally, most of them do not possess smartphones or gadgets that would allow them to embrace them into like access code through technology. A good number of the clients we work with would not, for example, use a platform as we are using today. Then in terms of what support is required, there are some recommendations that have been made by various actors, including the Global, Six, Global 16 campaign, and they are very relevant to our circumstances. So as an institution, what we think should be done, one, we should increase the enforcement of legal measures against perpetrators of violence. We have the um, which should include the issuance of protection orders in line with the Protection from Domestic Violence Act. There's also a need to support the existing safe shelters. We have very few safe shelters in the country, and the ones that we have are currently quite overwhelmed by the numbers. So there's need to support the existing safe shelters in terms of financial and technical support to enable them help handle the increasing number uh, of women escaping abusive homes. There's also a need perhaps for county governments and the national government to establish more safe shelters, including considering the use of hotels or schools as temporary safe shelters. This has been done in other parts of the world, for example, in France. Then there's need to provide financial assistance to survivors and those reportedly at risk of domestic violence who may otherwise hesitate to report uh, threats or incidences of violence. The, can the government has spoken of social protection measures, for example, cash transfers, and uh, we would like women, women workers included, as they have lost their livelihoods and um, they're the ones in a majority of cases who manage households. And this would enhance their security and also recognize the essential care responsibilities that they have. There is also a need for our development partners to increase funding for women rights organizations, including community-based organizations who are the, at the front lines of preventing and addressing violence against women in its many forms and also may be able to adopt the operation to do so as a rapid response. There's also a, a need to ensure that uh, there is participation of individuals of different backgrounds and from a variety of sectors who ascribe to human rights principles in the process of set, setting policy and making budgetary allocations to deal with COVID-19. Then there's also a need to continue with legal aid services despite the MOH guidelines and also to fully operationalize the Legal Aid Act. Perhaps as I conclude, I'd also like to mention that as an organization, we've also received about two cases of um, sexual violence cases where the perpetrators are reported to be police and we are following up on the same. Then the concerns on the use of quarantine facilities as a punishment is a growing concern even for us as an institution and it's something that we, we are also taking up. Thank you. cases of SGBV, that's quite shocking. Mm -hmm. So you can only imagine how many people are not reporting. But it's quite impressive that you go ahead and give them counseling because uh, victims of SGBV need that. We'll now move on to the third panelist, Mr. Masharian Joroge, who is a program officer at the Users and Survivors of Psychiatry. Are you there? Mashari, are you there? Oh, we'll move to the next panelist, 
Ms. Flora Bidali, the Acting Executive Director of the National Legal Aid Service. We've seen that the justice sector has greatly scaled down its services, and this includes the National Legal Aid Service, all, all, as, an, all as measures to reduce the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic. However, we saw that the LSK filed a petition, and as a result of this petition, uh, Justice Correll directed that the CS Fed Matiani includes legal services amongst the essential services. So what does this mean for the National Legal Aid Service? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, sorry about that. Now, thank you for this opportunity. Now, our services shall continue. And uh, please allow me to give a short brief on what it is that we can do, who we are, and how we are going about during this pandemic. Now, the National Legal Aid Service is established under the Legal Aid Act. And this act establishes the legal and institutional framework for legal aid in Kenya by giving effect to articles under the Constitution. In particular, we look at Article 48 on access to justice. We also have Article 19 and Article 50. Now, through ENLAS, we provide legal aid and funding for legal aid in Kenya and for connected purposes, among other services. ENLAS adopts a collaborative and consultative approach in provision of legal aid services in order to ensure that services are responsive, affordable, accessible, and speedy. Now, under this act, what is legal aid? We include in providing legal aid, there's legal advice, there's legal representation, then there's also assistance for the litigants. It can be assistance by resolving disputes through alternative dispute resolution, drafting of relevant documents and effecting services incidental to any legal proceedings, creating awareness through the provision of legal information and law-related education, recommending law reforms and undertaking advocacy work on behalf of the community. Now, at Endless Father, we hope to enhance our services by coming up with other legal aid providers. The regulations, which at the moment are at the tail end of being regularized, they, but briefly, they include accrediting the legal aid providers. These legal aid providers will include the advocates or a firm of advocates, universities that have a law clinic, government agencies, and other accredited legal aid providers as provided under the Legal Aid Act. We have non-governmental organizations to work with in providing legal aid services. Now, during this COVID period, we still continue to offer our services and we are or like everybody else facing the challenges. The opportunities we are using during this time to provide the services is we wanted to try and fast track the decentralization of services we provide in our regional setup, the accreditation of the legal aid providers. These are the areas we hope we, we are trying to fast track so that the services can be provided then enhance technology. You can see many of us are challenged in this area, but if we use technology, we will be able to reach to those who deserve our services. And then we'll design and operationalize a mobile legal aid clinic. We are hoping to get a free toll line where we can be accessed, accessed by our litigants. 
then conduct legal aid awareness through advertisement, documentaries. Roadshows may not be the right thing at the moment, but otherwise that is an area where we'll be looking at and having legal open days when it is appropriate to do so. The challenges we are facing, am I rid of them in the circumstances? Uh, challenge in the funding, the length, lengthy process in becoming fully fledged and uh, the pro bono services in the country, we don't have enough pro bono services and that is why we are hoping to enhance or rather speed up the regulations that we have so that we will be able to provide these services with minimum hindrances in reaching to Nanchi. And uh, to con in, in conclusion, I would say our partners, the partners we are working with, the law society, the civil society, we collaborate with different organizations so that we can enhance the services. As soon as we are able to come up with this toll free line, we shall share it with all so that we will try and provide services in the best and quickest way possible. Thank you. Uh, the toll free line is a very good idea because right now the number of people who need legal aid are very many given the circumstances. I will now move to the Law Society of Kenya, who will be represented by. I will now move to the next panelist. Yeah. I'm here. Ms. Wangare Kagai will represent the Law Society of Kenya. Wangari, we've seen the Law Society of Kenya has taken some positive steps in promoting the rule of law, such as through the filing of Petition 120 of 2020. Has the Law Society of Kenya taken any measures or rather has it put any strategies in place uh, to enable its members who are advocates to give legal aid more so to the most vulnerable during this time? Uh, for instance, we have seen in the media that tenants are being thrown out by their landlords. Some are sleeping out in the cold and some landlords have gone ahead and even removed the roofs and doors from their houses. Um, thank you, Santana and Aimee for this uh, session. I'll just begin by saying that the mandate of the LSK uh, with regard to legal aid is derived um, from section four of the LSK Act. And, uh, whose objective is to advise the government, the courts, and members of the public on matters incidental to the law. As we all know, um, lawyers are key players um, as legal aid providers in Kenya and are recognized as such under the Legal Aid Act. And because of that, uh, yes, um, the Law Society took a very positive step uh, once uh, the curfew was declared and uh, lawyers uh, declared an essential to file a petition and where we got judgment uh, to the effect that lawyers are essential providers of legal or of services because human rights violations are now on the rise because of the scale down of court operations as well as the, the socioeconomic implications caused by the crisis. So, um, the actions taken by the Law Society, first of all, I think I'll begin with the challenges that uh, the Law Society has faced in providing legal aid under the prevailing circumstances, one being that uh, legal aid generally requires close human interactions. And uh, at the Law Society, we receive around 50 litigants a week. 50 working clients requiring legal aid interventions on one matter or the other. And of course, now due to the, the prevailing circumstances, we are not able to receive clients. So there's limited ways to which we can, we can receive information from them on the violations that are being occasioned on them. We've also had, um, a problem with the communication with the uh, legal aid clients 
because uh, not everybody can afford to call, not everybody is techy savvy enough to communicate via email, the legal aid violations that are taking place on the ground. So we are not able to gather information sufficiently on our all matters that require interventions as we usually would have. We also have reduced manpower. Um, we run a pro bono database of around two, 1,200 advocates um, practicing in diverse categories, um, ranging from family to land um, to criminal and all kinds of matters. So at the moment, uh, we're not able to um, intervene uh, by way of making case referrals by clients to pro bono advocates because obviously um, these circumstances have also affected uh, the advocates um, they're not able to um, operate as they usually would in making interventions to legal aid clients so we we have um, and also of course there's the economic strain on everybody that usually pro bono would require that um, would require that um, um, advocates move around and uh, you know that costs it it has some financial implications so we cannot sufficiently be able to to represent legal aid clients as usual there's also a slow response to matters due to scale down of court operations. Matters that require uh, interventions uh, through the court process cannot be undertaken at the moment um, sufficiently because of the scale down of court operations. And um, lack of resources, again, um, these circumstances were unprecedented. So um, there wasn't a, a fund or a kitty where we could um, borrow from or tap from to make the interventions that would be required under such circumstances. So we are facing a challenge with that. And uh, infrastructural challenges as well, because uh, um, right now, um, due to the directives by the Ministry of Health and Social Distancing, we're not really able to attend um, to matters physically and require information and technology or rather computers and uh, and uh, telecoms to to be able to respond to emerging issues where uh, as of now we we are limited in that way so the interventions that lsk has made so far are uh, in two ways first we had interim measures where uh, we set up a hotline to receive distress calls and document human rights violation, collect data. And uh, once we do collect that data or receive these distress calls, we attempt through our members, our pro bono members, to make case referrals to uh, our partner organizations, such as Kenya National Commission on Human Rights, FIDA, and, uh, and institutions that specialize in whichever area that we're receiving the distress call for. We also attempt uh, to represent some of the most uh, urgent and grievous matters uh, in court. For example, uh, and this is done through uh, at both the national office and through the branches. Um, for example, in the case where there's a lady, it was a wide reported case where a lady in Rift Valley somewhere, I think is it was in Eldoret, uh, was doused in Busa uh, for having uh, been found to have committed an alleged uh, offence. We, we sought out a pro bono representation for her, and we have someone from uh, the Rift Valley branch who's following up on that matter and making the necessary interventions. There's also the case in Siaya where um, the, it was alleged that um, a particular individual, uh, the late, um, I, I don't know, I can't find his name, but um, the, the, the gentleman who was buried under unclear circumstances, the Law Society also in liaison with the West Kenya branch, is looking into that matter with the possibility of making interventions. In fact, there's a petition 
already in court uh, to that in that regard. There's also the Likoni ferry matter. Uh, the, the victims of the oh the CIA petition is petition number one of 2020, John Oko versus uh, the chief in Kondiek location where the LSK is supporting a petition seeking for orders of exhumation of the body of James Oyugi. Um, and uh, maybe a proper reburial if um, in a decent manner in accordance to the World Health Organization guidelines. There's also um, other interventions range from collaborations with the community-based organizations. We have gone to the ground and uh, we created a template where the, the social justice centers can document human rights violations and report the same to us for interventions. Um, we developed an e-guide, a legal aid guide, um, you know, with the directives by the Ministry of Health advising that we exchange, uh, we, we avoid exchanging of hard copy documents uh, to curb the spread of the virus. Uh, we found it prudent to create, to develop content on issues touching on uh, the ordinary monarchy, such as the ones you pointed out on evictions uh, from, from their home premises, their dwellings, um, wrongful termination from work, which is quite rampant at the moment. There's encroachment of land. Uh, uh, there's all kinds of people uh, taking advantage of the situation and uh, all manner of infringement of rights. So we we uh, identified the most uh, the most rampant um, infringements and developed a guide to give Monanchi um, information on how they can safeguard some of their basic rights around these areas. And I think I, I have provided the same, and it will uh, be you can share it maybe as part of this uh, seminar it's very it's very easy to read very friendly and we use the community based organizations to disseminate the information contained in this guide and uh, and we have received a very good response on it it um it has been widely consumed it was even trending i think on twitter at some point uh, because it contains very very useful information for members of the public um, for the midterm um, interventions, we are in, in partnership with the UNDP. Uh, uh, in, we intend to roll out a program where we'll virtually train legal aid providers. We'll begin by training trainers, training of trainers of uh, legal aid providers. And because this crisis has given us a unique opportunity to, to actually um, see the use of tech or to understand and appreciate its importance, we are going to virtually train trainers on legal aid who will in turn um, train uh, lawyers and legal aid providers in how um, to equip them to respond to the emerging issues uh, under the prevailing circumstances being that we cannot really engage in a physical way. Then uh, we are also going, we are hoping to also train community based organizations or other members of social justice working groups virtually as well, because they're the front line of receiving um, uh, human rights reports on violations from the grassroots. So we, we would like to train them on how to, to collect data and how to report to the legal aid providers and also how to document accurately. So uh, for all this, we will need uh, uh, to leverage on technology. And, and we also, one as, as the last intervention in the midterm, we are also uh, looking into, in collaboration with uh, UNDP under the PLEAD project as well, on leveraging on tech to conduct legal awareness clinics to members. That's a big project, perhaps what, how we plan to, to Effect it is by starting at branch level slowly and then um, increasing as we increase our capacity and our and our infrastructure. So the challenges that we are facing in, in implementing some of these really ambitious interventions, especially the midterm ones, is uh, of course uh, finances. 
funding this uh, large projects uh, huge projects and they require a significant amount of funding and um, a multi-stakeholder approach for us to be able to to achieve the the objectives from them so i think in a nutshell um that is uh what uh, the lsk has done so far and the challenges that we are facing and uh and what we are hoping to achieve in the future thank you as the bar association of kenya those interventions are very timely i will now hand over to amy who will moderate the next session Thank you, for, thank you all for painting a very clear picture of what the situation is regarding COVID-19 legal aid approaches and the challenges that we are facing. Our next speaker is Zena Musa. She's a community-based paralegal with the Nubian Rights Forum. We can only start to imagine what the challenges are on the ground in trying to promote access to justice. Zena, could you share with us the kind of work you're doing as Nubian Rights Forum and how you are adapting to the situation right now? Okay, basically at the Nubian Rights Forum, we work with the minority communities in Kibra, that is the Nubian rights, the Nubian community and the Kibera community at large. Basically, we use paralegal based approach, whereby the paralegal go to the ground, empower the community and sensitize them. Currently, we have a lot of challenges that we are facing as the Nubian Rights Forum, whereby what we are doing currently, we have a timetable, which is rotational. The paralegals come in the office one day in a week just to help with the working clients and also to work together with the other community who are coming to ask questions and to be empowered. Also, we have uh, paralegal are currently working at home, whereby they are Salesforce, we have a real time database. Hello? 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 Can you hear me? Hello, Zena, we can hear you. Please proceed. Oh, okay. Whereby the paralegal are currently working at home, they are following up on their cases. That is the backlog that they have previously, and also they call the client and follow up on whatever measures that they have taken. And also we have hello. Zena, please proceed. We can hear you. Hello. We can hear you, Zena. Proceed. Yeah, we have paralegals who work at home and they use a real time online Salesforce data that they use to work with the clients, the past clients and the current clients. And also we have uh, the Salesforce shows the real time cases. They have the, the pending cases and the current cases that the clients and the paralegal need to follow up on. And also with that, we have Paralegal are still continuing to use the radio program whereby they empower the community. They sensitize them with regards to COVID-19, with citizenship rights, and also with whatever the, the measure that they have to take during this pandemic. And also we, as an organization, we are continuing to empower the community and also the with our social media accounts whereby we empower the community and the Kibira, the Kibra people and the Kenyans on how they can, on the empowerment on citizenship and the COVID-19. Next slide, please. Uh, the main challenge that we are facing currently, we have the measures that the government have put in place that we need to follow. Mainly our work involves field work. We work with the community we work with them throughout their when they are going to get this document but currently we can't do it because they have been the gathering has been suspended we can't hold our community forum we can't work with the clients and we have we have the the clients who are have 
high expectation in us. They want to get their documents. They want to do something with their documents, but they can't. So they rely on us. How, how can they do it? And difficulties in getting essential materials to work from home is the internet. It's very hard for advocates who can't access internet to work from home. We've been told to stay at home, to work from home. How can we do it if you don't have internet, if, if you don't have smartphone? And we have lack of resources, especially for the people who are working in the ground when they are going to empower community. They are told to wear a mask. If they don't have the mask, they get arrested. So those are the part of the challenges that we have. Next slide. And the emerging issue with the COVID-19, we have legal services have been rendered redundant. Like we can't go to, we can't file our cases. We can't go to court. The registration office, people can't go and apply for this document when they need it. They have to wait until this COVID-19 ends. And we don't know where, when it's going to end. And we have filing of the cases nowadays is done online. How can, if you don't have internet, how can you file a case online? And maybe if it's an emergency case that you need to be follow up on, how can you do it? Police brutality, we've, during the curfew, police have been beating community members very badly because of the curfew. So we have a lot of cases of police brutality. And there is also high rise of gender-based violence, whereby majority of the community, they don't know where to report on these cases when they get abused because it's COVID-19. They don't know where to go and report. And also there is misbehaving of the health officers and the chiefs. They ask for bribes. If they get you that you don't have this must you don't have the if you are not doing whatever the government are saying they ask you for bribe they arrest you then they ask you for bribe next slide next slide please currently what we need for this to work on these issues we need funds you can't go sensitize the community if you don't have funds you can't go and empower the community if you don't have funds you have been told to do this and this. The, the World Health Organization have put measures in place. But how can we, us as the implementers, how can we do it if we don't have food security? Majority of the community member here, they are living from hand to mouth. They can't go to work currently because they have been told to work from home. We have people who are working in the Akali sectors. How can they put food in the table? access to internet. We have people who are being told to work from home, yes, but they can't even have a smartphone. They don't have internet to work from home. So those are the things that we need from the government and the donors. Thank you so much, Zena, for painting a picture of what's happening on the ground. It seems in Kenya that the issue is in providing the services, a lot of the solutions have been to use technology, but therein also lies a challenge in technology because not everybody has access to this technology. Not everybody has access to internet, social media, and then we have uh, some organizations that are trying to use radios to spread the word, but this is also funds intensive. I'd like to take this opportunity to go over to Uganda and see what is happening in Uganda in terms of access to justice. And uh, we are very happy to have FIDA Uganda online to tell us what is happening through their programs director, Irene. Um, thank you very much, Amy. Um, I think, um, the situation in Uganda is very similar to the situation um, in Kenya as well. And a lot of the speakers have alluded to some of the issues that we are facing. But I think I will start with a bit of a context because um, the way the lockdown is being implemented in Uganda is different from how it's being done in Kenya. And that has a significant impact on how access to justice services are being um, uh, sort of accessed, uh, but also on some of the human rights issues that are coming up. So 
we've only, we've registered to date about 75 cases of COVID-19, but Uganda is in a total lockdown. So what that means is one, there's a ban on social gatherings, which means that a lot of our community outreaches cannot be undertaken. And we know that legal education and community outreach um, and mobile legal aid clinics are some of the ways that we are able to help rural communities and the poor really access legal assistance. So because of the ban on social gatherings and emphasis on social distancing, this interaction is actually not possible. In addition to that, we also have um, a ban on public and private transport. And a lot of our clients and the communities that we serve rely on um, um, taxis, what we call taxis, minivans, um, buses and motorbikes, especially to be able to access services, whether it's health services or legal services. So we see that as a result, um, reporting of cases, especially of violence against women and girls has become especially difficult. Um, it's also difficult for them to access essential services like health services, especially in cases of sexual violence, where this is really critical. Um, also, um, like um, my colleague from FIDA Kenya spoke, um, access to family members in cases of violence has become difficult. So um, victims of, violent, of domestic violence, for instance, are not able to um, seek refuge with family members or friends. And so you find that a lot of um, these victims are trapped with their abusers and of course we also have a curfew so that means that a lot of the violations that are happening in the night um, a lot of the victims cannot quite do anything about. Um, according to the directives on our lockdown in order if you have a health emergency you have to seek permission from the resident district commissioner who is one of the senior most officers within the district so that he can give you permission to be able to go to a health center or um, your nearest hospital, so to speak. So this has also made it difficult um, for victims of sexual violence to be able to access hospitals and to be able to access the police in order to report cases or even legal aid service providers. Um, we also have a system during this in our COVID response where there are certain services that have been categorized as essential. So for instance, we have health workers, journalists who are exempt from the, the movement ban, so to speak, so they can move freely. However, legal services are not categorized as essential services. So for a lot of the communities who depend on legal aid service providers, unfortunately, the legal aid service providers cannot reach them in their time of dire need. Um, in addition to that, neither are social workers and counselors running um, victim shelters categorized as essential services. So majority of our um, shelters are actually closed. I think there are just two shelters around the country that I know that are still open and are able to provide services to victims. Um, and we also have our courts being largely closed right now. So what that means is that um, perpetrators are not going to be able to be arraigned in court like they're supposed to be. And so as a result, often you find that the police has to release them because they cannot be formally charged and arraigned in court. So they're going back into the communities to continue to perpetuate violence against um, their victims. So largely the measures in Uganda that have been put in place to address COVID-19 have not been very inclusive. They have not taken into consideration the different vulnerabilities of certain groups that are already marginalized and poor. Um, and they've also been largely gender blind. Um, and so this has deepened a lot of the challenges that poor and vulnerable groups have in accessing justice. Um, I will speak a bit based on this context, on how this has affected how we are working and how these groups are able to access help. Um, one, we have found that we have to be, to really adapt and be flexible because the context, um, especially in the last couple of weeks has been changing um, really drastically with the president issuing, I think in the last couple of weeks he was issuing direct directives every couple of days. 
So we have had to be very flexible, but we have also had to reimagine and redefine what justice is under these circumstances and what some of the most critical services are that we have to make sure that victims can always access even um, with all of the restrictions that are in place. So we find that we are spending a lot of time um, on the phone, just like other service providers, helping to follow up cases um, with um, law enforcement to make sure that they're responding to cases, um, supporting with mediations. Um, so a lot of the work is being done on the phone, but we also recognize that in most of the communities where we work, um, especially for the poor and the vulnerable, they do not have access even to um, phones to be able to call in and report cases. So despite the fact that we have really shared um, our numbers widely, the toll-free numbers, um, and we have partnerships with local radio stations and, and, and media agencies to be able to share these numbers widely, we are sharing them on social media, but a lot of rural communities, quite frankly, still cannot reach us in order to get legal assistance. And um, for some of them who have emergencies, of course, we are supporting to get the necessary permissions that they can move in order to go to health centers, to get treatment for victims of sexual violence, um, to be able to get post-exposure prophylaxis to make sure that they are not um, going to contract HIV, to give them emergency contraceptives. But you still find that um, it's difficult for them to reach us in order for us to be able to support them. Um, we have also been working quite um, closely with our community justice structures. We are really glad that for the last few decades, we have heavily invested in building strong structures within the community of cohorts of people that are um, aware of human rights and legal issues that support communities with legal education, advice, referrals, um, and mediation of disputes. And they have become indispensable in these particular circumstances because they are closest to the community. We cannot move to go into the community to mediate disputes, but they are already there. So as much as possible, we are working with them to to resolve a lot of the, medi um, the disputes through mediations. They're also helping us um, to flag emergencies in which we need to um, intervene, and they're also helping with the referral of cases. So at this point, I think they have been our strongest link in um, handling cases. Um, in order to continue um, with the legal education, which I think is particularly essential now because of the sharp rise in cases of um, violence against women and girls. We are now using podcasts. So we have um, a company that we work with that helps us to record podcasts that we can then share um, using different avenues, including radio, which um, is quite accessible in rural areas. So we have had to repurpose a lot of our budget lines that are related with um, administrative costs that we are not using now. We're not using a lot of fuel and so on and so forth. So we are using a lot of these budgets to make sure that we can share more information, um, cautioning the public on violence. Um, our schools are closed to so children at home. We're talking to parents about the impact of, of, of children um, witnessing violence in the home. Um, and so on, so that we try to curtail the human rights violations um, that are occurring. Um, we're also doing a lot of work on social media and being able to provide legal advice um, to people who have access to social media and are able to reach us through the different social media platforms. Um, we also have, we've rolled out toll free lines so that people who cannot bear the cost of calling in, we can kind of shoulder that for them so that we are able to engage with them a lot more. Um, but we have also tried as much as possible to collaborate with the village health teams and, and law enforcement teams that are working on the ground, on the ground, whether it is that they are, they are enforcing the directives to address the pandemic we are working with them as they go into the field to be able to go into the field and identify cases that we need to respond to um, i'd like to close with just a few recommendations i think in our case uh, what is happening is a lot of legal aid service providers are 
really fighting with their hands tied behind their backs. And I think the government can play a role in providing some space and some wiggle room within which we can operate and we're able to support communities better. Um, and, and, and we have been calling on the government to categorize legal services and at the very least legal aid services as essential services so that legal aid service providers can use um, their human resource and financial resources to support communities at this really critical time. Um, of course, we, also we are also calling on them to have a gender lens to our COVID response plan. I, I feel like it's, it's, we are already about five weeks into our lockdown, but it's not too late for the government to incorporate a lot of the feedback that's coming from rights organizations and communities as well uh, to make sure that the plans that they're issuing are more inclusive and that they are able to respond better to the rights of those that are most vulnerable in their communities. Um, lastly, is for the government also to kind of preempt rights violations. We have seen ministries that have come up with um, guidelines on how certain things must be done. Um, for instance, right now there's a stay on um, land evictions, for instance, so that people don't take advantage of the situation um, to kind of um, uh, evict poor people, um, especially where cases are in court and so on. So if, if, if the government can put in place some of these measures, um, especially in the critical areas like land, um, have some toll-free um, hotlines for GV, GBV reporting and so on. We feel like it's going to be able to support um, communities better. As much as we are committed and, and, and we have the expertise and would like to help, we feel like without uh, being provided space by the government to actually operate during this time, we're not able to help communities as much as we actually can. Yeah. So that's the situation for Uganda. It's 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 not a very good situation. But what I can say is, uh, from observing what other legal aid service providers are doing, they really are putting in all that they can under the limitations that they have. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Irene. Um, from your presentation, it's quite clear that now more than ever, the grassroots justice networks that we have need our support and we're trying to grapple to see how we can support them to be more effective in doing their work now and also i mean it's it's quite commendable that FIDA has been trying to be flexible in the use of funds and trying to shift some funds from you know the public gatherings into using podcasts and radio it's something that we could learn it helps but i'm sure of course it doesn't solve the problem but thank you for sharing with us what's happening in uganda um Next, we had missed a colleague of ours who is working with um, users and survivors of psychiatry services in Kenya. And mental health is quite um, an issue when it comes to the COVID-19 situation. So Masharia, I had read in the newspaper, I think last week, that mental health institutions were turning away COVID patients or patients suspected to have COVID because they don't have protective gear. And I'm wondering what is happening to this category of people who this is really is an access to health issue. So Masharia, please tell us what you're doing. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. And sorry, I missed on a few speakers because of some technical heat. Uh, the, the current challenge of the COVID-19 pandemic is actually escalating. Bearing in mind that even before the pre-COVID-19 season of the previous periods, we had been having very discriminatory practices on persons with mental health issues or persons with psychosocial disabilities. And actually one of the major bottlenecks is discrimination in terms of law and practice. Uh, but we find majority of our populations are actually incarcerated in penal institutions and mental health facilities. They do not access basic or fundamental needs like food, proper shelter, and clothing. And even medication is a challenge. And that leads to deprivation of liberty within these institutions. And um, we also lack proper uh, monitoring and reporting framework. Therefore, when they are in these institutions, it's already problematic. And whatever happens with them, the problem is only getting worse. Um, majority of others are also homeless 
and also are found in the informal settlements, or in the slums, and also those in the rural areas, some of them living in families, and they're actually uh, shackled or they are restrained within family facilities due to stereotypes that they don't want to be seen in the community, they are a bad or men, or the stereotypes definitely associated with mental health conditions. And there is so limited access to information, especially those persons in the rural areas. Right now, we have a lot of information on our mainstream media that is being given as directives by the ministry. And also we have other information being dispatched in terms of uh, social media. But majority of the people with mental issues in the rural areas are not able to access information on what is actually happening. And there is uh, abuse of power by state agents, like what happened in Eldoret, whereby a person with a psychosocial disability was clobbered to death, and it hasn't been reported, and it all ended there. Uh, they also have victims of domestic violence who are distressed, and they don't have a reporting mechanism. If they try and go out and report, it will only get worse with them. Uh, actually, it's very true what you read about uh, people being turned away from the outpatient clinics, and uh, that is in our main hospital, that is Mathari. They can't access medication or prescriptions, and a good number of them can't even get private uh, uh, clinics to attend to because of the social economic status. So among these and things like um, the restriction, and when the government is putting on strategies and their directives, they are not putting into consideration that some of these people actually need to move around and seek for help or seek for other basic services like food. Some of them do not have permanent homes, you know, have nowhere to reside, they have no access to water, to shelter. So, and they might actually be caught outside the curfew hours and the police, instead of responding to their needs, will just respond to the restrictions and clobber them and get their way and maybe even go ahead and uh, quarantine them in their facilities. So their needs are actually not being addressed by anyone. So as an organization, we are coming up with a few recommendations or the steps that need to be taken. And one of them is that information is power. Therefore, information in accessible format should be given to these people wherever they are across the world and also we also need capacity building of state agents that's the police and other actors on crisis response strategies such that when these people are found maybe loitering or they are found outside the curfew hours they can receive the necessary help instead of being victimized and brutalized at the same time also i think it's important right now to to embrace uh, the legal services and the paralegal services as an essential service on access to justice, such that we need paralegals recruited all over the world. And um, the, the, their capacity is built on the, the response strategies for persons with psychosocial disabilities. And, um, and when once this is embraced, I think, um, Despite, okay, like we are having the, um, we have uh, the hotlines, that is the government launched a hotline to give uh, psychosocial support. But then basically that could be an advantage or just one component of the needs of a person with a psychosocial disability. Because we need to look at the person as a whole, what comes first, the basic needs, food, shelter, and the personal security. And how well is the psychosocial or counseling services going to impact on these people? How effective is, is it? And how is the recruitment process and how is the involvement of every stakeholder on board? I think for now that's all. Thank you so much, Masharia, for giving that eloquent presentation of what's happening to persons who perhaps have mental health issues. What's coming out from your presentation is that justice is essential. We agree. And the picture that you paint is quite, I mean, it's quite saddening. Uh, but it also gives us an opportunity as a region to generate our own knowledge in crisis management. So what we don't see is a copy paste of what's happening in the West being implemented here and not taking into account our context. So yes, it's a public health crisis, but it's making or exacerbating the already existing access to justice issues 
and um, further, further disenfranchising people who really deserve this uh, justice and essential services. Now, I'd like uh, also now to go to Somaliland, where they are trying to help incarcerated people to access justice during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Caitlin from the Horizons Institute, please let us know what you're doing. Wonderful. Thanks, Ine. Uh, my name is Caitlin Lambert. Uh, I work uh, for Horizon Institute as the legal advisor, and we're an NGO working on advancing rule of law and access to justice and human rights in Somaliland, which is um, the self-declared state in Northern Somalia. So what I'm gonna do today is just give you a quick overview of what our work looked like before COVID-19, some of the challenges that are coming up from COVID-19, and then some of our adaptations that are proving successful so that we can still help um, the people that we serve. So since 2018, we've been running a paralegal project that works with prisoners, so working inside prisons, um, and police detainees. So working inside police stations when we have access, but finding people at court. Um, and basically the way this works is follow up in person, going to the prisons, working with prison staff, working with the prisoners, working with police officers, going to court, going to the prosecution, and following up cases. And um, this was a new approach uh, for Somaliland. We modeled it loosely off of um, the PASI model in Malawi. But it's become really successful for us and for our work and specifically for targeting arbitrary and unlawful detention. And in 2019, our team, and we're a fairly small team of about 10 paralegals, uh, we released over a thousand people from police and prison who didn't need to be there. And that's a fairly sizable number in Somaliland where the prison population, there aren't really solid official figures, but it hovers around 2,500. And then maybe in the police stations around a thousand at any given time. And the way the team was able to release those people was working in person on the ground, continuously in offices and following up um, with families, with court staff, just tons of in-person um, work. So that was before COVID-19. And as of the 19th of March, we've been doing this all remotely. So that's when the Somaliland government started putting in measures to combat COVID-19, you know, canceling school, limiting travel, putting in a curfew, similar to a lot of what's happening in the region. And we decided to take at Horizon a pretty aggressive approach to protect our staff. Because social distancing, I think, is not, not possible in Somaliland. And a lot of our staff live um, in close quarters with you know, different members of their families, multi-generational. They have small children, older people all living together. So our number one approach at Horizon was we have to protect our staff and then hopefully in turn protecting the people we work with. Um, so this is a big, big challenge. We had done some remote casework before, um, but it was a really big challenge because at this time, as you all know, legal aid is more important than ever, especially those working in the criminal justice system. It's a health response, right? You have to depopulate these overcrowded facilities. Somaliland is like most um, countries throughout Africa where the prisons are over capacity, police stations are over capacity, there is no sanitation. I mean, it, as soon as it gets in there, it's gonna spread. Um, so that's really when this started becoming a reality in Somaliland and the first known cases were on 31 March. Um, there hasn't been much testing, so we don't know how widely spread it is. Uh, we actually have to send our tests to Nairobi, and there's only been about 170 people tested. Um, 
So, you know, it's really a critical situation. And for us, the main challenge was, okay, how do we continue to depopulate places of detention while keeping our staff and everyone else safe? So, uh, Marta, if you can go to the next slide. Um, the bulk of our work is really focusing on casework and we do individual casework. Um, we have done remote, over the phone follow up uh, in the past with rural populations, so we knew we could do that. Um, but the biggest uh, challenge would be getting in new cases. So, you know, between end of March and the beginning of April, we were just working on backlog. And during that time, the team successfully released 51 people from detention just over the phone. Um, basically working with family, focusing now more on the family mem member rather than detainee and telling them step by step what they had to do. Uh, one example, we were working with an eight month pregnant woman in a police station convicted. And um, it, her court date, her appeal court date was coming up right when we went working from home, but the paralegal on the case explained to the family, this is exactly what you have to do and the timing you have to do it. And if this happens, do this, or if this happens, do this. And we successfully released her and she was able to go home. So really the idea of legal empowerment is alive more than ever in Somaliland. Um, rather than doing it for someone, it's really walking them through step-by-step step what a family member has to do to get a loved one released. Um, so it's been really gratifying to really still be able to do this over the phone, but the number one challenge we identified early on is, okay, we can work through our backlog, but we need new detainees. They're gonna keep getting arrested. We need to find new people that we can keep serving. Um, so our first solution was pretty basic. All the paralegals have really good relationships with justice sector actors, police officers, judges, prosecutors. Okay, let's put together a contact list, identify all the different prisons we work with, who's responsible every week for contacting that prison, that police station, that court. And we've gotten a lot of cases that way. Um, the team was a little hesitant because you know, doing something new is always hard. Uh, so we also opened a hotline and you can see in the graphic that I provided, you know, basically saying, do you know someone in police station? We can help. Um, and this is an ad, a sample advertisement. We also do it in Somali. And we've advertised the hotlines on social media, on TV and word of mouth. And interestingly enough, that's been fairly um, successful and we're hoping that's something we can do past COVID-19 to get to more rural populations. But the biggest solution has been working with justice sector actors. They have given us 90% of the cases, new cases during this time. And I think that just goes to show, you know, the people who are in it, in the police stations, in the courts, in the prisons, they know what's gonna come if they don't depopulate. So they're looking for resources, they're looking for people to help as well. Um, next slide, please. Great, so the casework, pretty straightforward, getting new cases from justice actors, hotlines, and doing it over the phone. Another big part of our work is legal education, specifically with prisoners, You know, taking them through the beginning of the criminal justice process, remand, bail, all the way to appeal. And so we didn't want this to stop when we can't be in places of detention. So we've adapted most of our material to focus towards family members. So I'm someone in Somaliland, my child is in a police station, what do I do? And so we've developed, you can see an example here, what is purchasing a sentence and then putting it on basically social media, which is one of the best ways to communicate in Somaliland with people all over uh, the country. We all also do this in Somali. And what we've been focusing on during COVID-19 are different ways to release someone, whether it's bail, whether it's out of court mediation, whether it's turning like this example, a prison sentence into a fine and paying that, 
um, just doing step by step what you would need to do if you were in this situation um, and trying to get that information out to the people who really need it at this time has been a big strategy. All right, next slide. And um, another point that we've been doing, which we don't normally do too much because uh, our work, we try to build close relationships with the justice sector actors. Um, we don't air their dirty laundry. We try to work close with them, with the paralegals to find a solution. But given the unique situation of COVID-19 and the issue of prison overcrowding, we've gone public. Um, on 18 March, we uh, released a statement saying we have to we have to depopulate prisons. That's number one. Look at what's happening in the world. Um, other countries are depopulating. Let's start focusing on this. And you know, using that, but also back uh, you know private advocacy as well with people in power. And on the first of April, um, the president pardoned 574 prisoners which is about 20% of the prison population in Somaliland. And so it was a great victory for about a day. <laughs> and then we started doing our monitoring, following up what's happening, our people released, everyone's released. But as is a situation in other African countries, people who are being held in police stations and who are convicted just were transferred to prisons um, and took the place of everyone who was released. So the situation of overcrowding didn't change. So we released a detailed statement on the 13th of April saying, okay, that was great, but it didn't solve the overcrowding issue. That's still a huge problem, not just for prisoners, not just for prison staff, but the communities that surround them, right? Um, so we released another statement. We're in conversations with the people in charge and another second pardon is being considered, hopefully another 500 people. We're also doing advocacy on, okay, it's great to do releases and you know pardon people, but there's lots of things in the law that also limit arrests and also limit you know, pretrial detention. So really trying to use our casework from the paralegals um, and advocating for, for some more radical changes on a broader scale. So that's what's happening in Somaliland. And I would just close by saying, you know, it's clear from all the presentations today and also the situation in Somaliland legally, especially in the criminal justice system is connected to public health right now more than ever. Um, so, you know, one thing we're talking about with our donor and I would encourage donors to think about is really, it's not just one solution to a problem. You have to think of the big picture, right? Education, public health, access to justice. And I think even more right now, access to justice. So thank you all. Thank you so much, Caitlin, for your presentation. And it ties really well with how Eric McCoy from LRF had begun. And he said, really, that this we need to adapt how we are working, and donors also need to be fairly flexible. And the most important thing is to look at the bigger picture of the consequences of COVID-19 pandemic. Mm, one thing that stood out for me from your presentation is, which I think is quite genius just for me, is using our greatest resource as Africans to promote legal empowerment. And that's our family. That's our sense of identity, our community. So legal, legally empowering families to help those who are detained for me is quite a, it's quite a novel practice. And I think it should form part of our knowledge in crisis management. Mm, lastly, I would like to now go to Tanzania and where we will meet the legal services facility. They will tell us what's happening in Tanzania. And as um, Irene from Uganda had pointed out that the lockdowns are quite different in the region. For Tanzania, it's, it's unique. We find it interesting. And <laughs> Lulu, please provide some background as to what's happening in your situation. 
Hello. Um, so unfortunately, I can't be seen, um, but have been seeing and have been following everybody very closely. I hope you can hear me well. Um, I would like. To... Okay. So, okay. Okay. So, so thanks, Amy, for 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 um, for setting the scene very well. As I was listening to everybody speak. Um, I am very aware of the differences between our countries within the East African region. Um, Tanzania is unique in a sense that um, there hasn't been uh, direct, um, um, how shall I say, direct instructions on lockdown or anything like that. Um, but there have been a lot, the Ministry of Health, I have to say, has been very proactive in terms of giving um, information in terms of um, social and physical distancing and, and, and all the other precautions that we know about with COVID-19. Um, so it's interesting also to say, to see um, which is not what was expected, but it's interesting to see that people, despite um, the ongoing situation in the country, people have been following the WHO and the Ministry of Health instructions um, when it comes to prevention um, for COVID and precautions for COVID-19. So just recently uh, going out, um, uh, almost 80% of people that have been counted had their masks on and they are observing physical distancing as well. A lot of us are, uh, who can are working from home and have been for the past probably four weeks. So um, despite um, uh, not having the same, uh, the, the, the same, the same policies as, as, as others, I think in terms of observing uh, the WHO instructions when it comes to COVID-19, um, there are a lot of them that are being observed so far. Um, um, so, um, uh, in terms of, of, of our work in Tanzania, I would like to start where the last presenter left off. Um, and we really, as always, have been focusing uh, um, in general on access to justice and how the pandemic is impacting or has impacted access to justice. Um, and, and as much as, 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 as our work with paralegals is being affected, but in general, we're looking at um, how access to justice has been impacted in the, big, in the, in the bigger picture. So um, the, there are a lot of initiatives that are ongoing. Uh, a lot of issues that have been mentioned by other presenters uh, previously, uh, we are dealing with as well. Um, so in terms of, um, maybe I'll start, I'll start off with um, uh, what we are seeing as, uh, as, as a challenges, um, the challenges that we're focusing, yeah, uh, we're, we're, we're faced with. So there are implementation challenges. I, I have to say, before I continue with this, um, I'm going to try to be very brief, but I have to say we as LSF, being a, uh, both a grant maker and, and an implementer as, as, at the same time, we look at these challenges both as challenges that we're facing as LSF, as the organization, but also the challenges that our grantees are facing and ultimately the challenges that paralegals are facing who are the frontline um, um, teams um, on the ground. Um, so we have some implementation challenges. Um, this includes uh, uh, implementation of uh, pre-planned activities, your normal day-to-day -day, um, paralegals initiatives, uh, overall access to justice um, uh, activities. We had a lot of um, forums, for example, conferences and, 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 and a number of um, 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 uh, activities that were to bring a lot of people together this year. Those, of course, have been impacted and we, we are looking at other ways to deliver on those planned activities and also monitoring. We do a lot of monitoring in terms of visiting our grantees and, and, and working with paralegals directly on the ground. That has somehow been impacted because of less, less movement uh, but also less of the gatherings. Um, 
um, also, um, one of the challenges is also looking at ensuring safety for the paralegals and continuity of the services, as I said before. So we are looking at different, um, we, we initially had um, 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 uh, sent out communication to all our grantees and also paralegals in terms of uh, adhering and making sure that they're, 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 they're protecting themselves, but also protecting the communities and making sure that they, 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 they take as much precautions as they can um, during this pandemic while, while carrying out their day-to-day -day activities. Uh, we're going through a transition just like everybody else in terms of the new way of working. Communication is really key. As I said, we communicated earlier on, uh, have been communicating. We keep on updating and we keep on finding new ways of working, using social media, using the media, radios and things like that to reach our, our, our communities, but also working directly with paralegals um, and a lot, of, a lot, a lot, a lot of online meetings. Um, there's also been, we're reviewing our funding, our own funding uh, um, and reallocating funding to different activities. I think this has been mentioned before. A lot of activities that were physical are not physical anymore, so we are reallocating. We're looking at new activities uh, based on the current needs. Um, there's also uncertainty. Um, we as LSF and everybody else around us we are just basically um, uh, uh, adapting to changes as they occur and and coming up with new ways every single day. So you you do have a certain element of uncertainty. Uh, emerging issues uh, from COVID-19. These have been mentioned before. I will not go into details. I'm trying to be very fast. Um, but um, sexual gender-based violence, including domestic violence and, and early marriages, because of, uh, of course, schools have been closed here too. Schools, colleges, universities, all of them have been closed for over a month now. And children are at home. And this is basically provides an opportunity for people who want to have these harmful practices. Um, there's also been a rise in FGM cases. Um, we are monitoring and following up on all of these issues. Uh, we hear of domestic violence as well. We, again, a rise in it. We are monitoring it with other partners. But we know there'll be issues with access to justice as well. So we are looking at uh, the congestion of prisons, looking at, uh, we're working very well with the police uh, uh, on the police gender desk for domestic violence and also judiciary has started doing online cases as well. We are monitoring all of that. Uh, support needed from donors and government. From government is just more awareness and, and uh, raising campaigns. We are working very well and very closely with the Ministry of Health and uh, Community Development, but also Prime Minister's Office, uh, the response team, uh, COVID-19. Uh, partnerships as well. We already had an MOU with the Ministry of Health um, and already a work plan that was to be implemented this year. Um, now we're looking at revising that work plan in addressing, um, incorporating the COVID-19 response work plan that the Ministry of Health um, and Community Development has to see how we can support. We're looking at engaging more um, in terms of supporting the Ministry um, so doing a lot of joint planning and implementation with donors, um, realignment of planned activities, flexibility in reporting mechanism, specific grants to address the pandemic. We've already had a lot of discussions on this. We're actually implementing this at the moment. Uh, strategies very quickly. Um, again, we link ongoing uh, in activities, initiatives with efforts to address the pandemic and specifically with paralegals. I won't go into further details in, in terms of the general um, uh, access to justice, but, but with paralegals, what we're doing is working again closely with Ministry of Health and Community Development, training paralegals and making sure that they can also deliver messages on COVID-19 uh, whilst they're out there. They are still uh, implementing their activities while observing um, 
um, uh, physical distancing and also protecting themselves as well. We've provided them with gear, uh, protective gear, but also making sure that uh, very small gatherings with a lot of physical distancing. Um, we are again working in partnership with government initiatives. We continue to communicate um, effectively with paralegals and share resources and guidance to help them to navigate through the crisis uh, and also updating very regularly. regularly. Um, with our grantees, we, we, we acknowledge that there will be issues with reporting and delays in implementation of activities. So we are monitoring this. We've asked them already to share with us their plans, mitigation, and also we are providing them with the space to ensure that they're able to do that. Um, also, uh, flexibility as well. We know that uh, we have to be flexible during this, site. this time. We're also asking our donors to be flexible with us as well. Um, and also accepting budget um, reallocation as much as we are also reallocating our budgets as well um, to ensure that we address the pandemic, but also there are new activities that are coming up. So we're asking for further funding to support the new um, uh, initiatives um, that directly link to the pandemic. Um, and then we're assessing, uh, we have some grantees that are, the grants are coming to an end in September, December. So we're looking at no cost extensions and seeing how we can support them during this time so that paralegals can continue to do the work that they're doing as much as they can, though very limited. I think that's it for me. Do I have another slide? No, Thank no, you. No. You're smiling. Do I have another slide? No, Lulu. <laughs> I really, I really, I try to really rush through so that we don't run out of time because I'm, I'm very aware of the time. So yeah, I hope I have covered everything. You've given quite a clear picture, and from your presentation, what I'm picking up is that the government, you work, the government is seeing civil society and the community as a partner in trying to yes. um, get and work around this COVID-19 pandemic. And I think it's lessons that countries in the region can learn from what LSF is doing in Tanzania. Well, also quite like the approach of using paralegals to deliver key messages, because that was quite yes. a, a strategic approach that was also used in Sierra Leone when they were trying to you know, address the Ebola pandemic. So of course, yes. staying advantage of the paralegals at the grassroots level, they're able to access areas that we cannot, and this is this is their role for now during this COVID-19 pandemic. So thank you so much for that presentation, Lulu. Lots of lessons for donors, for civil society, and for government. Um, right now, we'd like to open up the question session. So if you do have a question, please raise your hand, and we will be able to take in your questions. Marta, do you have anything to add? No, um, we have received quite a few questions. So, um, yeah, I don't know if you if you guys want to start with those, and then we can um, ask people to just um, ask their questions directly. But we've got like a long list already. Okay. Yes, we have access to the questions, and um, we shall begin with a question to Ella um, Ella Riff, to Eric McCoy. Could you please repeat the point on payment of bail terms? This is a question from Gilbert Omwari in Kenya. Eric? Yes, I'm here, I can hear you. Uh, thanks for the person who has filled with that question. Uh, what I meant was that uh, we have been working with the court and prisons to ascertain some people who cannot afford certain bills and bond terms. And if they are in the context in which our projects can respond to anything less than 5,000, maybe 2,000, 3,000 shillings, including fines we've been paying so that they leave facilities where people are congested. That is what I meant. Thank you. Okay. And also to the Kenyan panelists, Gilbert is asking, why isn't prison decongestion an agenda in Kenya? It's an agenda in Somaliland, it's an agenda in Tanzania, but Kenya seems not to be speaking about this. So for the institutions that work in prisons like LRF and ICJ, 
what would be the response to that? Uh, maybe I will go first before Santana, even if she's a moderator. <laughs> I would like to say this. Uh, the fact that you don't talk about it doesn't mean that it is not an agenda. Uh, part of the legal aid work we do is purely to reduce numbers of people in pretrial detention. Number one, we have engaged plea bargain agreements, working together with ODPP and the court to ensure that people who can plea bargain can actually shorten their, their time in the criminal justice system. Uh, we have been working on uh, something I think which ICJ is very key about. It is how do we turn some of the uh, economic, uh, economic related crimes like hawking into administrative processes so that women who form the majority small scale uh, business people who don't have licenses actually end up in jail. So can we use administrative methods to decongest uh, prison and people with the number of people who are being incarcerated? We have been working to build capacity of preterm detainees, even in the context of COVID, by developing audiovisual materials for them to understand self-representation, for them to understand, uh, to understand court processes that will have been difficult because we can't meet physically. So the fact that you don't talk about it does not mean that it is not an agenda. Thank you. Okay. I suggest you have... ICJ mainly works towards the congestion of prisons through uh, the offensive campaign, which seeks to uh, decriminalize petty offenses such as loitering. These offenses are mainly found in the bylaws. So the campaign seeks to create awareness of the petty offenses. And also, it seeks to reform those legislations that uh, contain those petty offenses. And ICJ sits at the National uh, Committee on Criminal Justice Reforms for this purpose. Uh, we have another question from Sarah Kasande in Uganda, and I guess this will be directed to Irene. How do we make a case for integrating emergency legal services as part of the humanitarian response to COVID? especially to respond to cases of gender-based violence and provide legal assistance to victims of human rights abuse, such as like torture, arbitrary arrest, and inhumane quarantine conditions. Irene? Um, hi, Amy. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Sorry, my network it wasn't very stable. Could you just please repeat the question? Yes, yeah, so this question comes from Sarah Kasande. She's asking mm -hmm. how to make a case for integrating emergency legal services as part of the humanitarian response to COVID in Uganda. So when you look at cases of uh, SGBV and then also providing legal assistance to victims of human rights abuses, of torture, arbitrary arrest and inhumane quarantine conditions? Um, I'm, I'm still trying to get what the, the exact question, how she would like me to address that. But I think um, how we are trying to go about doing that because we recognize the need for the integration uh, from a very practical perspective, um, based on the needs of, of, of vulnerable people, but also from a, a legal and human rights perspective. And what as an institution, but also as an institution uh, working in a coalition with other women's rights organizations, human rights organizations, um, legal, um, um, how do I put the collectives of, of, of legal organizations, we are trying to lobby the government uh, because we are very clear on where the specific gaps are and what actions the government can take. So we are um, lobbying the individual um, mandated offices to try and make sure that the integration actually happens and that we are able to um, respond better but without the government, like I said earlier, without the government actually providing us this space, I feel like um, our hands are really tied. So the key is in the advocacy and lobbying that we have to do with government as individual organizations, but also as collectives and, and alliances. Thank you. 
Uh, the next questions are directed to Enlas. Um, the first question we have from Irene is she's asking what everybody else I'm sure in the country wants to know is when will the rules on accreditation be made public? And also kindly confirm whether or not the accreditation will include annual payment to Enlas. Uh, another question from Bernadine Ongaro is does Enlas have a referral pathways for having complex especially human rights violations, including sexual offenses and ones. And um, I think we'll take those questions for now. Hello? Can you hear me? Did you hear? Yes. I hope you got the questions. You are echoing. I didn't hear the first question. Could you please repeat? First question is when the rules are expected to be ready. This is a question from um, Irene Jaguar. When the accreditation rules will be ready and made public, and if people are supposed to make them. The second question is from Beverly Ongaro and asking if you have referral pathways for cases dealing with SGBV or under or the offenses under the Sexual Offenses Act. No. You're echoing a lot, but I had the question from Irene when the accreditation will be published, right? On the accreditation, we are waiting for publication of the regulations, which stipulates who will be accredited. Can you hear me? I'm also echoing. Yes, I can hear an echo on your end. Um, perhaps uh, if anyone is on, could you please mute your microphone? Anyone's microphone which might be on, please mute it. You, Flora, maybe you can proceed on behalf of Enlas now. The second question you the second question was on the issue of referral pathways. Referral. Network of people you're working with. The relevant body that will deal with it. We also have volunteer services like the counseling and the rest. So we do a lot of referrals in different areas. As you know, legal aid and counseling is one, they go hand in hand, especially when it comes to GBV. So we do have a network for referrals in different areas. Uh, thank you for sharing that with us, uh, Flora. Even if there was an echo, what we commit to do is we have the questions and we will share with you and you'll be able to answer them and, we, uh, and share with the persons who've asked the questions. Since we're coming up to the hour, it's seven minutes to 1 p.m., we would like to end the webinar here and thank you all for participating in this webinar and for sharing your experiences with us. As I had mentioned earlier, this webinar is going to be recorded and shared with you. So you can, if you miss the presentation here or there or whatever is happening in one country or the other, you'll be able to listen to it. Lastly, I'd like to um, mention that as Namati, we have a COVID-19 justice challenge. And what this challenge is looking at doing is trying to bring the attention of donors to the COVID-19 pandemic and say that now more than ever, justice is essential, basically echoing the theme of this discussion. And what we are asking you is, how are you adapting to these challenges and what kind of support do you need? So in your emails, I hope you don't mind, we will share the justice challenge with you and we will use these responses to let the donors know that this is what's happening in the ground and this is where we need your support the most. For everyone who participated in this uh, webinar, thank you so much. My name is Amy Angesel, and it has been a it has been a pleasure moderating this session. I'd like to thank all of you for joining. I hope uh, this webinar was useful. It was useful to myself. I hope it was useful to all other legal aid providers. 
and we shall share our community after this with all the recommendations from the different uh, presenters. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.